Starting off, we've already talked about the Newton's method. Okay, this was lecture four way back. And we talked about, okay, how we can apply the Newton's method to linearize essentially the source term. Uh, so we looked at PDEs or ODEs, in fact, uh, where we had nonlinear source terms. And then we said, okay, you can uh, apply the Newton's method to solve the resulting nonlinear discrete equation. Okay, and then homework two, you actually uh, solved this problem d square phi dx square equal to e to the power phi, if you recall. Okay, uh, so we are extending that now, and we're saying, okay, we apply the Newton's method to solving a PDE with nonlinearities throughout the equation, not just in the source term. Okay, so this is a natural mechanism or avenue for us to follow if we want to solve nonlinear equations the Newton's method, okay? And in fact, it's used quite a lot. I'll talk a little bit about that. So I'm uh, using an example here to demonstrate the whole concept. So suppose I have an equation which looks like that. Now it's multidimensional and you can see nonlinearities everywhere, okay? There's nonlinearities here, there's a phi times phi here, and so on, okay? Now this equation that I've written down here is very similar to what you see, for example, if you want to solve the Navier-Stokes equation. So Navier-Stokes equation, for example, if you look at the x-momentum equation, here you will have a u squared, u being the x-component, okay? And here, instead of phi squared, you will have u times v, v being the y-component, but you will have an additional partial differential equation for V, which makes basically the equation nonlinear because you have the product of two independent variables, or sorry, product of two dependent variables, okay, U and V, uh, which makes the equation nonlinear. Here I have introduced something like that. Now, if you think about your Navier Stokes equation or your energy equation, let's say if you're doing heat transfer, this is where you will have properties such as mu thermal conductivity, and so on, okay? Right in, right here, which is the gamma that we used um, in our finite volume formulation. And most of the time, in real life, that gamma, that transport coefficient, <coughs> will be a function of the dependent variable you're solving for. For example, if you're solving a energy equation, the thermal conductivity is going to be a function of temperature itself. Okay, so right here, you are going to have kappa as a function of phi, which makes this term nonlinear now. So what I've done here is I've said, okay, how about we make it just an arbitrary linear function of phi to demonstrate the concept, okay, which makes the equation nonlinear. So even if you didn't have these terms, it would still make your Poisson equation nonlinear because of the dependence of the property or the coefficient in front on the dependent variable itself, all right? So that's where that comes from, uh, that equation structure that I've cooked up. Now, boundary conditions, uh, for simplicity, I'm just using Dirichlet boundary conditions. So this is uh, just a sketch of what the boundary conditions look like. So zero on the two corners here and one on the um, right and top, corner, top uh, boundaries, okay? So before we actually discretize, I'm going to do some simplification. So this term here on the right-hand side, I'm going to differentiate through. So you see there's a one here, so that simply gives me this term and that term. These two give me those two, okay? And then they, I have a ddx of phi d phi dx and ddy of phi d phi dy, okay? And again, to simplify, what I've done here is I have inserted this here, so that becomes one half of ddx square of phi squared. Okay? Um, so just inserting that in there so that I get this nice divergence form that I'm used to. All right? So this is the equation. This equal to that is what we are going to discretize in the end. All right? So now let's say we use, just for the sake of simplicity, we use finite difference for discretization. So again, these are all you're familiar with, central difference here, central difference here, central difference here, central difference here, except for these terms, we, have, we are central differencing phi square instead of phi. All right? 
And then on the left hand side, I've also used central difference for these two guys, even though that's not traditionally used for fluid flow type applications, but let's just stick to that for the time being. Okay. So those two are also done using central difference. Yeah. Can you go back and explain where you um, go back here a little bit? So this is our discrete equation then that we are going to solve, okay, in the end. And of course, it's a nonlinear equation. If we didn't have these terms, these two terms, then it would be very easy because then we could define our unknown as phi square and just directly solve for phi square. But because I have a phi square term as well as a phi term, uh, you have to treat it as a nonlinear equation. Okay. Yeah. The, the point you just mentioned, I guess. All right. So let's move on then. So now we are going to apply the Newton's method, and we start by constructing the functions. So this is the gen uh, the general formulation of the Newton's method. What we do is we construct these functions, set them equal to zero. Okay. And that's what we are in, in the end solving. So our functions are, of course, this is for our interior nodes. And here I'm using this unique index k that we talked about, global index, OK, instead of i and j, because we have to have uh, a, you know, a one-dimensional vector form uh, of the equations. And then boundary nodes, we have that, OK? So where I've used that same formula that you're used to for your nodal ar arrangement k is equal to j minus 1 n plus i. Okay? Everybody okay with that? All right. <coughs> then we obtain our partial derivatives. <coughs> so you take this expression, you differentiate it with respect to phi k. So this, here's your phi k. Okay. Then you differentiate it with respect to phi k plus 1, phi k minus 1, all the unknowns that you have in this equation. So there will be five partial derivatives. Everything else will be 0, Okay, because there are only five unknowns in that equation, phi k, k plus 1, k minus 1, k plus n, and k minus n. All right. So those are your five partial derivatives. And if you think about now your Jacobian matrix, this basically goes into the diagonal, then this one goes to the basically it gives you the band right next to the diagonal the sub the super diagonal this is the sub diagonal and then these two bands are the ones that are far away okay and for the boundary nodes of course when you differentiate you just get a one that, that just goes into the diagonal and this is very similar to what you've done in your homeworks and you've been setting up using finite difference where you put a one in the diagonal and the uh, uh, you know value of phi on the right hand side so very similar. The Newton update, this is your formula. So here's your Jacobian that we just calculated, this guy, times the change in phi is equal to negative of the function. Okay. Now the function evaluation, of course, you're doing at the old iteration value. Okay. So that's basically just this guy, computed at the old iteration. And then you update your formula. Okay. Now the important thing to note here is that the coefficients of the Jacobian are now, now themselves have phi. So right here you have phi k. So these are actually phi star k computed at old iteration values. Okay? And so what that means is that within every iteration, within every Newton iteration, you have to update your values of the link coefficients. Okay? They are no longer constants. So that's an important difference because this is a nonlinear equation, right? Now, of course, one of the problems now we run into is that this system that we have for updating is a pretty large system because if you take, a, let's say, a 100 by 100 mesh, you have uh, 10,000 equations to solve. So you can't use uh, Gaussian elimination and you know, for the homework problem, for example, you just used a tridiagonal solve because it was a 1D problem, which made it very easy. But here you cannot do that. So you have to solve this, this system, this update equation, 
using an iterative solver itself. Okay? So, and of course, you can use any of the linear solvers that we've discussed so far for that purpose. And so that brings us into two sets of iterations. One is called the inner iterations, which is iteration of this equation, or solving that equation by iterative means. So for example, if you use Gauss-Seidel for that, you will have Gauss-Seidel iterations to solve for that. Okay? And then you have the outer iterations, which are the Newton iterations themselves. Okay? Because this equation that we have, you have to solve them repeatedly, as you did in your homework too. Those are the Newton iterations um, and con continuously update your solution because it's a nonlinear equation. So the inner iterations are for the iterative solver. The outer iterations are to treat the nonlinearities. Okay? Now the tolerance level to which you, your linear equations must be solved depends on the problem at hand and the type of nonlinearity. Okay? Uh, generally, if you use excessively tight tolerance, it wastes CPU. In other words, you don't want to solve this equation very tightly, okay? Because you know that in the outer iteration, in the Newton iteration, you have to do that all over again. So why waste all that effort? So what people usually do it is they would take it to partial convergence, but of course that's very problem dependent. Sometimes you might find, I'll get back to you in a moment. Sometimes you might find that if you converge it by six orders of magnitude, uh, it's not as good as if you converge it by nine orders of magnitude. Okay? Yeah. Um, so I thought Stone's method was a direct pentadiagonal solver. Well, but see, Stone's method also requires iterations. Okay? Because Stone's method, what you did was you did approximate factorization of the A matrix into L and U, and that forces you to iterate. Okay, remember the problem we solved with using Stone's method was a linear problem, but still it required iterations, right? Uh, so there is no, uh, just to kind of put a blanket statement on this, there is no linear algebraic equation solver that will give you a solution without iterations other than Gaussian elimination, okay? Unfortunately, Gaussian elimination is too expensive, so we can't use it. All right, so excessively tight tolerance might waste CPU. On the other hand, if you use excessively loose tolerance, you might get divergence, okay? And again, that's very problem dependent. And the other thing is that if you use loose tolerance, what happens is this Newton iteration, which has this beautiful characteristic that it gives you quadratic convergence. You saw that in homework one, the residual turns this way, okay? It doesn't go linearly on a log scale. It goes that way. Okay, that's quadratic qu quadratic convergence, and that is disrupted if you use a loose tolerance criteria on the inner iterations. Because what it's saying is that uh, the value of the change that I'm getting out of solving this equation is not quite exactly what Newton's method wants you to, because you you're not solving that equation exactly. Okay, by using a loose tolerance. So the quadratic convergence is disrupted, okay? In any case, here's the algorithm. So we start with a guess for phi, just like we always do. We calculate the function. We calculate the derivative. This also requires phi star, by the way, as I mentioned. Then we solve this system, which gives us a new value of phi. And to solve this, you need inner iterations. This is your solver iterations. Okay, and then you update your solution and you repeat this block here until you get convergence in the outer iteration. Okay, so that's the basic procedure. Now, what uh, one of the things that people have done over the years, and there's a lot of research that has gone into this, is that they have found that, uh, First of all, people like the Newton's method because of its quadratic convergence. There are very few methods out there which give quadratic convergence, okay? So then now they're saying, okay, now we have to solve this large linear system. How do we do that within the Newton iteration in a more effective manner? So what people have done is they have come up with these new formulations which sort of integrate the Newton's method with 
linear algebraic equations in a very seamless way like the conjugate gradient solver and come up with these methods called Newton Krylov solvers for uh, nonlinear equations. Okay? These CG methods are called Krylov subspace methods. There is another very powerful method I mentioned earlier on called GMRES. So there are these methods called Newton Krylov nonlinear solvers which integrates the Newton iteration within the uh, or integrates the CG or GMRS solver within the new Newton uh, method to give you very effective solution for nonlinear equations. Okay. Uh, the, another another direction the research has gone is that people have realized this that storing this J matrix, this Jacobian, computing and storing it is pretty expensive. So how can we simplify that process? So there is a class of methods called Jacobian free Newton uh, Krylov's methods. Okay, uh, that's another very powerful uh, method that, especially if people in the finite elements method, have been using a lot. Okay, so that's just to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the field. But the overall idea is still the same: that you have to solve a set of nonlinear equations repeatedly within a Newton iteration, and. The Newton method, as I said, is attractive because of its quadratic convergence. Why? Because if you get quadratic convergence, the number of times you have to do this outer loop, these steps go down significantly. And what that means is this humongous nonlinear system that you have to solve, you don't have to do it too many times. Okay? And you will see that in the example uh, that I show you. So in the inner iteration, we are monitoring the residual of this system. In the outer iteration, we are monitoring the residual of the full nonlinear set of equations. And what happens is that convergence, these two become the same because you know this is a linearized form of the nonlinear equation. So as you get towards convergence, the delta phi becomes very small. So the higher order terms in the Taylor series expansion disappear. So the linear system essentially becomes the nonlinear system. So. And you, again, you will see that in the uh, data that I show you. So here I use the strong stone strongly implicit method with a tolerance of 10 to the power minus 6 for both inner and outer iterations. Okay, uh, 101 by 101 mesh, and this is what we get. Okay, so here are the outer iterations, Newton iterations. So you can see it converged in six outer iterations, but to converge 10 to the power minus 6, six orders of magnitude within each iteration, I needed those many inner iterations of the Stone's method. Okay, But the beautiful thing is that as you go towards convergence, as I said, the residual of this and the residual of that becomes the same because the change from iteration to iteration disappears. You quickly diminish this way. So towards the end, your number of iterations is just one. Basically, it's become sort of like a linear system Okay, as you get towards convergence. Essentially, what's happening is you start with the guest value of phi, okay, and then you update it. You solve it. You update using your Newton update. Okay, The next iteration, the change is so small that basically you are treating this like a linear system where all the higher order terms have disappeared. Okay, So that's what's going on. Here is the convergence plot for the Newton method. This is very similar to what you saw in homework two, if you recall. Okay, uh, Quadratic convergence. Normally, you expect this to be linear on a log-log scale, on a semi-log scale, but this is turning sharply downwards. All right. And here's the solution. There is nothing uh, very exciting about it. It's just uh, the solution to that nonlinear equation. Okay. I, if you recall, our boundary conditions were 0, 0, 1, 1 on those two forms. Okay. Any questions?